Okay, I would like to introduce Brent Fannin. He is our speaker tonight for Gopher Games, The Fight to Save the Heart of Florida. He has a background in environmental education and communication. Brent's going to tell us just a little bit about the film before we take a break to go watch it. Thank you, Brent. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll tell you like a, a tiny bit about me and then a little bit about the film before you get to watch it. Um, and for those of you that have already seen it, maybe this will be a, a little more interesting for you. So uh, I'm a filmmaker and I, I studied film in college and a little bit in L.A., but mostly from Indiana, where I went to college. And I graduated into the recession and uh, I couldn't really find a job. I didn't like Hollywood. So I went into education, ended up at uh uh, in Orlando with the theme parks and doing environmental education, which is where I kind of fell in love with the environment. I fell in love with Florida. And um, almost 10 years later, I ended up at UF working at the College of Journalism. And I uh, ended up getting a grant to make a documentary on the Springs, the Florida Springs. Um, that one's called The Water State. Let me throw that one in the chat for you real quick if you're interested in that as well. Um, that one's on the Florida Springs, but after I finished it, I, I was like, I have to get back into this. It kind of like rekindled my passion for telling stories via documentaries. Um, and, and it made a huge, you know, a huge impact in Florida. I'm hoping to see some legislative change in the next few years based on that. Um, and so when it finished, I really wanted to do something else and I didn't have anything waiting. And so I just started reading conservation stuff that popped up in my newsfeed and I, Someone said, hey, do you like gopher tortoises? You should look into them. And so I ended up Googling and finding a bunch of Craig Pittman articles. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Craig Pittman. Uh, very satirical, but his really clever stuff that he writes, I think, for the Tampa Times mostly, but um, uh, various outlets. And uh, I just realized that there was just an unending amount of stuff on how badly things were going for the gopher tortoises. And then when I learned how important they were as a species and constantly was talking to other people in the building and other friends and family and all of them love anyone that was in Florida loved gopher tortoises and said I can't believe what's happening you got to tell this story and I started researching talking to a few different people and and uh, I finally met with Chase Pirtle who you're going to see in the documentary he runs the Ashton Biological Preserve in Archer Florida and he he if it had been in person he would have grabbed me grabbed me by the shoulder or by the shirt and said you have to tell this story uh, no one's telling this. We've we've been getting our butts kicked for years. We need your help. And that was really all it took for me to be like, absolutely. Um, so I researched and researched and researched and uh, we got a team together and we made Gopher Games. It took about two years. And that's from like start to finish about two years. And um, I think that I mean, that's probably the uh, the best kind of like how the how the film got started but i think there's two really important things that will help you appreciate the film if you're about to watch it and, and appreciate a little more if you already have seen it well uh, the first one is that this is not my this is not my documentary i directed it i was if you watch the credits i was a big part of it uh, in many different ways but it is it is a story from the collective hearts of anyone in florida who loves gopher tortoises we talked to dozens if not over a hundred different people i have reached out and spoken with many people on social media as we started our Instagram accounts and got you know people talking about the documentary before it was even done. People were reaching out to me saying, hey, can you use this footage? Hey, how can I help? Hey, how can I spread the word? Um, so a big portion of the documentary is actually stuff from people who just reached out online and said, hey, can you use this? And I said, absolutely. Um, so it's it's not my piece. It's not you know the, just the, me and the producers. It is It is a story that has been piecemeal together from from hundreds, if not thousands of different people. Um, and that's why I think it's made such a big impact and people love it so much is because it's not just a species that we love, it's a species that we love that's important for all the other species. And it's a story that everyone's jumped in and pulled together. Uh, and the other thing I think is really important to know is that we did this on our own. This was like 100% volunteer work. Not a single person on this project got paid. Uh, we had a budget of $3,000 that covered basically our travel expenses. And and that was it. Um, I've got a little bit of money left over to do some marketing to, to for film festivals, but that was all we had. And so uh, I think it's a great piece. I think it looks beautiful. And I think the story is what's the most important. And on that minimal budget, we were able to find people knowing that they would not get paid, that were complete professionals in what they did. And they were like, I'm in. 
In fact, I had volunteers come in and say, hey, I got a $5,000 camera that I haven't used. Can I come out and film for you? <laughs> uh, so just the response overall for this film, but these animals was just like the icing on the cake that said, yes, you're doing the right thing. Yes, you're going in the right direction. People do care and they will care. Um, and so it, it's, I'm, we were very, very proud of it, very excited to release it. And uh, it's gotten a lot of support and I'm hoping that you guys will support it as well. And you'll be willing to share it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but when we finished this documentary, me and the two producers, we, we didn't want to stop. We wanted to like keep the momentum going. And so we have released a petition that I've put in the chat, but I'll do it again later. Um, and that petition is basically to try to pressure the Florida legislator to pay attention and reform the FWC. And it lists some, some kind of basic ways that we think that the FWC commission can change to make things better across the state. And then along with that, I have not made this public yet um, on, on our social media, but I am working with a Florida representative to come up with a bill proposal that we want to get submitted as a bill to the legislature in January, and then hopefully it'll make it to the session next year. And it probably won't happen this year. I think you guys more than most know how long it takes to actually get something done in Florida politics, but we'd like there to be reform in the FWC. And even if a quarter of the stuff that we're proposing happens, that's a big change. Uh, so I'll talk more about that at the end, but um, yeah, I hope that's enough to kind of enhance um, enhance your your viewing of this of the piece and uh, that'll help you enjoy it a little bit more. Um, and again, I'll be here at the end and, and answer questions if anybody has them. Brent, you brought up a, you made me think of a question. You said um, fundraising. How did you raise that $3,000? And are you still looking for fundraising funds? <laughs> so um, I used chain or uh, uh, shoot. It was like I crowdfunded online. I used, after I had been posting stuff on our social media, I then posted a fundraiser on a website um, that crowdfunded uh, GoFundMe.com. And we ended up getting uh, a total grand total of $5,000, three of which went to production and two of which was for after production stuff. Uh, and yeah, that, that was how, that was 100% of our donations um, was through GoFundMe.com. But as for future stuff, <laughs> I, I chuckled because as a doc, as someone who does this, because I love it, but also because I, I'm good at it and I would like to make money doing it. I don't. I didn't get paid for this at all, um, and I would love to get paid in the future. So, for my next piece, which I don't have one nailed down yet, I'm taking a little bit break for a while while we push the petition and the legislation. But once I do start another documentary, I'd like to get more funding. I, I'd like to try to go for. I don't. You guys are in Lock Tehachi area, right? If anybody knows anybody on Palm Beach. Island who would like to fund a documentary that's hopefully conservation based, send them my number. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd love to do in the future. I'd like to make something bigger and better. I'd like to be like path of the Panther level where we end up on Disney plus. That would be amazing. Will it happen? Probably not, but I have dreams. Have you submitted it to Disney? I, uh, sort of. Uh, Disney doesn't take direct submissions right. like that, but I have put it on a uh platform actually last week it went live on discover florida channel it's our first streaming platform uh you can download that it's just like disney plus and others but it's florida centric there's you can find it on their streaming um, but i have submitted to a website that does distribution for me and if if i get a hit i get a hit i don't think it'll happen but there's a chance all right does anyone else have any questions for brent before we take our break Do we actually go out of the Zoom and then have to come back in? Or do we just yes. leave it on? Well, you could leave the Zoom on. And if you open another window in your browser, if you know what I speak of, you could copy and paste the link to the documentary and you can watch the documentary. I would ask you to mute yourself or we're gonna hear 19 different people's version of the documentary on our Zoom. Does that make sense, Sheila? Yeah, I can mute myself right now. Okay. Well, and Mary Cassell has put in the chat that possibly WLRN would be a good, good idea. 
Brent yeah, has again put the uh, YouTube in also on the chat. So Brent, have you s submitted to uh, WLRN? Uh, is that a PBS affiliate? Yes, yes. I okay. have talked to my friends over at the College of Journalism, which would be W U F T, and um, it's it's not the right length. But even if it was the right length, even though we took great lengths to keep it non political, it's directly covering issues that are political. And in this climate, they weren't really, they weren't willing to take it on, uh, which I get. So I probably won't reach out to W L R N just because it's probably the same thing. They're not willing to stream it. Um, and I had friends at UF, and if they still weren't willing to to put it on, then it's probably not going <laughs> to happen. But thank you, Mary. I I do at one, on one day I really aspire to get something on PBS. Excuse me. So we can just copy this uh, Brent that you put in there, the YouTube site. Yeah. You can just click then... on it or copy it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. He's ready. I think everybody's ready. Uh, we have lost one or two people, but we're ready to start the discussion. And as Drew said, he's got a question in the chat. Do you see it, Brent? Um, yes. Yeah. So what members were on the committee that passed this measure? Uh, which measure are you talking about? Senate bill, what, 494? Yeah, the bill that you showed people commenting on and then they passed the bill to make it easier to developers to remove the tortoises. And I'm not sure because you didn't give enough and uh, much detail of what exactly it did. To make it easier, I mean, did it allow entombment? Did it just allow them to? I mean, what happens to the tortoises now? Maybe you can give us a little more detail on that. Yeah, I'll preface preface my answer with something that's important to know is that this this at this story is so much more complex than I could possibly describe. Uh, so for us to pare it down from what was you know could have been a feature length film into eighteen minutes was. Uh, painful and incredibly hard. So, so there is a lot that we left out on that bill. One of the reasons why we didn't go into depth on specifically Senate Bill 494. Um, I've been excited to talk to someone about this because nobody else cares about the details. Uh, here's a quick timeline of that bill and why it was so complex and why we didn't talk about it at length. Um, in October, October 13th, 2021, Senator Hudson filed the bill. Um, the Florida House discussed relocation costs on October 19th, just a few days later. November 18th, um, there was executive order. And then the, the Senate bill hit the appro Appropriations Committee committee late November. And then they made some changes to it in January. Changes to it in February. Let's see. Changes to it. Changes in March on March 1st. And then it wasn't until March 10th, 2022 that it was signed by the House and the Senate and then May 26th till it was finally put into law. So it was an absolute disaster of a bill that uh, was far worse than it could have been, which is good because there were a lot of people speaking out about it. Um, but really what it, I'd have to go back and pull the list that I was given by from um, Elise of all the like the really heavy hitters. Uh, but some of the big ones were like, I think they ch I think they were going to, but didn't change the the amount of like the hundred mile rule. I think there were exceptions made for holding times, exceptions made for uh, the amount of tortoises that could be in a specific place. Um, Can you elaborate, uh, Brent, on what you mean yeah. by holding times and how that affects the tortoises? Does that mean that you hold them for six months and then you um, you know drop them in the bucket of water till they drowned or what happens after mm. the end of a holding time? Yeah, the relocation program is really incredibly complex as well. And that's a portion of that. And the relocation program was one of the biggest um, issues where they had a bunch of changes in that bill. And so as a quick rundown of how this works, somebody buys land, they have to, before they build on land, they have to have an environmental company come in, do a survey. And that company, if that comes back and says, hey, we have gopher tortoises, actual tortoises mm -hmm. on the land. Um, then they have the, they have to then go to the government and say, okay, we found gopher tortoises. We're going to apply to move them. And then they have to, once they get the permit for that, they have to then find a recipient site. And that was one of the other big issues that the, that was shown is that we're running out of space because we're developing all of Florida. 
So once they find the recipient site, then they have to hire someone to come in and collect those tortoises and move them to a holding, essentially like a quarantine facility. And there were a bunch of stipulations on how long you had to hold them and then how far that they could go. And that stuff, honestly, I didn't do a ton of research into it because at the time I was, it was actively getting changed. So it seemed kind of pointless. Uh, but that was one of the things that's a big problem is that whole process, there's no scientific evidence to back any of the decisions being made by the FWC commissioners. And then, of course, they're repealing what kind of looked like protections, but maybe they weren't in the first place. Uh, so <laughs> Linda's question, isn't it disingenuous to have developers pay for the environmental study? Yes. And uh, the environmental study, I, I I know people who have actually worked on those teams and said that they were getting paid to lie about whether gopher tortoises were actually there. So the conservative figures of how many tortoises get moved versus killed is pretty off. Um, but there's no way to prove that. So we didn't talk about it in the documentary. Um, uh, Linda, I just have a quick question. Michael, did you want him to say something? Because he says he has to leave. Um. Sure. Michael, do you have a question? Uh, no, I'm sorry. That was a misunderstanding. I was watching the video. There's two minutes left in the video. So I'm here for the whole, I'm listening. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, and if no, anyone else wants to speak, um, certainly feel free to raise your hand, put something in the chat, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I, I just have another question, Brent. And, maybe. Uh, so... My question is on this, uh, why, uh, you know, why do they want to keep reducing the amount and why can't developers build uh, a refuge in the development? You know, I mean, we have rules to set aside open space when we do development. Why couldn't go for tortoises coexist? Um, Linda, is it okay if I use a swear word on this on this podcast? Is that is that, is that fine? <laughs> Just so, use the first uh, first initial. Well, um, we're all adults. We'll know. We'll know what you meant. <laughs> uh, very very succinctly put, it's because they don't give a crap. Um, <laughs> and in to in one of the this is the thing that makes me more angry than anything else. And you'll see this as a problem in my first documentary. And then I did one on gopher tortoises, and I was like, it's the same problem. It's because the commissioners are, they're chosen by the governor. They're not elected, so they don't answer to anybody but the governor. And even the governor can't fire them once they're confirmed by the Senate. So you, you they, they do whatever they want. And so they'll sit there and listen to, um, if you look at the, uh, the the Split Oak issue that's been happening where they they decided that a toll road could, a toll road can go through the Split Oak conservation area. They listened to 42 people say that they didn't want it and one person say that they did and they, without even a question, they all voted unanimously for the toll road. And that's because they don't care. They're getting paid directly through their companies or indirectly through a friend or a family member millions of dollars. And so, no, they don't care at all. So maybe it would be a good idea to make a, a conservation area in the middle of their development. But aside from that, the science is not in on if some of the aspects of the, the relocation program are good or bad, but there's plenty of science to tell us that moving large amounts of them is awful. There's diseases. And if one of them has a disease and you move them to another area, you don't know even if they have a disease. Um, and especially when the executive order hit and they removed the holding time or they made it indefinite, you could just you know pick up a tortoise and take it somewhere else. Um, so we were spreading diseases. There's a problem with the fact that it sometimes takes the females up to 20 years to become sexually mature. So if you're destroying a population and even moving some of them, it's going to take forever for them to get back on track. And then there's territory. They, they can be very territorial. So you don't know exactly what that concentration of in a certain area is. So if you're adding a bunch more tortoises, who knows if you've got too many. And even if you don't have too many, maybe they're going to be extraterritorial in one spot. So it's just this, it's just us assuming that we know how nature works. And in reality, the only thing that we know is that nature's chaos. And we're, and if that weren't hard enough, they don't care. They don't care at all. So even when their own scientists are saying one thing, they'll tell them not to say it, uh, or they'll tell them we don't care. So it's, it's all about the money. And that's the biggest part here is that every time I look at Florida's government, 
there's a developer in every single level. So yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say it, but they don't care. They don't care and they don't have to at all. I have one last question, Brent, and then uh, I'll let other people ask questions too. Uh, when somebody lies on one of these forms or whatever, isn't that a government document? And isn't there some sort of crime in lying? And the second question is, does that make the developer's approval, you know, uh, invalid because they're it's based on false information? Um, are you talking about like the commissioners lying or like underhanded deals? I think, I think no, he I'm was talking. talking you about... said when they when they do the report. You said when they do the report. Oh, okay. So what I'm referring they, you to. Said you said they told you that they lied and said there weren't tortures when there were. Right. So a developer hires an environmental organization to come in and do a survey. That environmental organization is not government. So they can absolutely lie if they want on the submitted paperwork. Now, if they get caught, they'll go to prison. But the FWC doesn't even have the resources to go out and investigate when someone calls and says, hey, we got a tortoise problem. So like they're they're not there's no real oversight of the relocation program unless you watch somebody lie and then make a call and somehow the FWC gets out there, and which has happened, but it's super rare. And so it, without every single like without millions of people watching every single development site. I'm sure that there is a lot of lying and money changing hands. Um, and there's not a lot of way to prove that it's, it's not, that it is happening much less not. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uncontrolled. It's, un, it's unsupervised. It's uncontrolled. Um, Does anyone else have, read, yeah, you can go through the chats and if anyone else has questions, feel free to raise your hand or put something in the chat. So uh, yes, Linda, uh, the holding time is, I guess, it is included or it, it is intended to be kind of a quarantine for diseases. But again, I don't think they're following the science. So whether or not it's short enough or, or too short or too long, I'm, I'm not sure. Hold on. So Chase Pirtle just jumped in. Um, he is, you know, he, you just saw him in the documentary. He's a producer as well as was, uh, interviewed. So he says it takes time to make sure they stay put. If you relocate and don't enclose them for six months, they attempt to go back to where they came from. There you go. It's a double whammy. It's both quarantine and to make sure it's resetting their internal clocks when they're not trying to travel 100 miles South to get to where they originally lived. I guess that speaks to the point when you see a gopher tortoise crossing the road, you help them in the direction they're going instead of turning them around. Uh, yes, yeah, kind of. Um, it's a more much a larger scale, but yeah. So um, now that Chase is in here, I'll I'll go ahead and say, Chase, can you send us uh, give us your um, your email? If anybody has more, like if you guys have like really in depth questions that I can't answer or that you think of later. Um, either go to our website at gophergamesfilms. Gophergamesfilm singular gophergamesfilm.com and go to our learn page. We have tons more information because we couldn't put it all in the doc. We decided to put it on the website. But Chase also just knows an insane amount of stuff. He's been doing this for a decade plus. Um, so uh, if you're willing to Chase, um, or you can, I can put in our email. Uh, there it is. Chase's C dash biodiversity. Um, he can answer because he's super, super knowledgeable about the very complex stuff. Um, I got, Gail, I don't know if you intended to privately send me the message, but you asked a question that I think is very important. But let me hold it until the end to see if anybody else has anything else. Anybody got something you wanted to ask? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about the 150 species that are dependent on the gopher tortoise. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any household name species among those 150? Yeah. Um, so it's it's three, three. I think the total was like, what Chase, was it 375? I think give me a thumbs up, I guess. I think it was 375 that I've seen actually listed in scientific documents. Um, to, there are 427. Uh, so a lot of them are invertebrates. In fact, the vast majority of them are insects. Uh, but there, there are a lot of things. Um, we have seen birds use them um, in their hunting insects. Uh, birds are using them a lot. We've seen 
Um, there was some video of the bobcats that you saw. Um, definitely snakes. We've got the indigo, which is a really important one. Uh, that's an endangered species and protected here in Florida. Uh, rattlesnakes will use it. Um, I'm sure there are other ones like armadillos potentially, and maybe some other our little marsupial, the um, the opossum. Uh, there are there aren't any. I don't think other than those ones that anyone's going to know the name of. Um, the gof gopher frog would be a number another one. And what's that little mouse, Chase? Does anybody else know the name of that little mouse? I can't remember. There's a tiny little field mouse that uses the burrows. I'm waiting for Chase to type it. I'll point it out if he does type it. Um, so yeah, there are some noticeable ones, specifically the snakes um, that people would know of, but it's a lot of insects, which doesn't mean they're any less important to the ecosystem, which is why they're called a keystone species. Because not only if we, if we get rid of them, not only are we wiping out that one species, but like we're destroying a whole bunch. Um, a lot of them aren't so cute, but they're just as important to the ecosystem. So it's just kind of overall, the Florida mouse, there it is, Florida mouse. It's just absolutely devastating to the ecosystem when we get rid of a species that creates a home for so many others. Did that answer your question, Richard? Yes. Okay. There we go. Three. Chase says three are only focused on during relocation and a complete farce. Um, oh, so that is one of the other things is, um, we didn't talk about the 300 or 427, whatever species, because, uh, you know, it's too much and there are a lot of insects, but, uh, the conservation efforts or protections that are supposedly in place, they, they barely cover the tortoise and they only talk about three other species and they don't care about any of the other hundreds of animals that are affected. There's no protections at all. So it's just, it's just such a blatant and mind-blowing oversight of conservation. And there can only be one reason, two, either incompetence, which isn't true because we have tons of science, or profit. They want to make the money, so they don't care. Uh, I'm going to read this real quick. Let's see. Uh, Kay says, several years ago, South Carolina member, or is that, oh, Sierra Club member, sorry, I'm up in Georgia right now. Uh, became personally moving gopher tortoises from an area that was under development and tried to get FWC to be more proactive, but was disappointed with lack of action. Um, I hate to say it, but I have heard this story so many times in the last two years. People reach out to me constantly on social media, and they're telling me this exact same story. The FWC doesn't care. I couldn't get a hold of them. Uh, they came out, but they did nothing. They didn't even want to come out. They actually told me I'm an idiot, like over and over and over again. There's lack of resources or just a complete disregard for what's going on with the tortoises. And I think a lot of people have started to hate the FWC members. Please don't. There's a reason why we had that that um, thank you to the FWC workers at the end of our documentary. And we posted it on social media and our website because they do work. They are us. There are people in the FWC that care. There are a lot of them. But it's the commissioners that do not care. And in fact, they're willing to do anything they can to make money. So if you guys do end up getting someone on the line from the FWC, be as pleasant and kind as you can and ask for their help rather than demand anything because they're on your side until you are angry. And then they don't want to be because that's just humans. So I've learned that being in guest services for 20 years. It's, you just got to be nice. <laughs> Whether or not you're angry, try to put on a nice face. Um, okay. Yeah, there we go. So Chase, Chase just po posted the ones that are included in some of the relocation protections. The pine snake, indigo snake, and Florida mouse, along with the gopher tortoise are all mentioned uh, in some of the protections, some of the actual protections that are supposedly in place. Anybody else got another one? Any other questions? I do. Might... I do. Oh, go ahead, Richard. Yeah. Um, is there, I mean, in the 1990s, um, Palm Beach County voted to acquire uh, habitat, intact habitat, um, before like the developers came in and took control of those properties. And is there have is there land that could be um, protected? go for tortoise land that could be protected as opposed to just letting it go for 
developer's highest bid? I, I mean, yes and no. Here's the problem. So Florida is covered in water, especially you guys know that down in South Florida. The number one area that gopher tortoises like to be, which is upland habitat, is the number one place you want to build in Florida. And as the sea level rises, the developers are forced to move farther and farther inland. And that's where the tortoises are moving as well. Um, so it's, yes, there's plenty of stuff that we could save. And sometimes we can, we're successful. But in reality, it will get worse and worse, like you saw in those graphics from the Florida 2070 project. Um, eventually we won't have any place for the, for the tortoises to live except on private land where people are willing to let them live. So yes, it is pretty obvious that we should be protecting some of that space, but when we could monetize it, why protect it? Sarcasm, if you were wondering. No, we get it. Yeah. We say that a lot. <laughs> um, Chase just texted me an uh, article real quick. I'm going to throw in there if you guys want to read it. This came out, um, July 8th. It says, for translocated Florida tortoises, survival is troublingly low. Uh, it's by the Wildlife Society. So if anybody's interested in reading that, um, check it out soon. Um, I have, I wanted to answer, I wanted to go back and answer that question that someone sent me. I think it was Gail. Um, but before I do, does anybody have another question? Because this was going to be a wrap-up question. And we're still going to do the mystery question at the very end, correct? Yes. Okay, okay, so, all right, yeah, I'm going to give you three seconds. Anybody got anything? Okay. Gail says, what can we do? This seems impossible. Uh, first of all, acknowledge that it does feel impossible. Because um, it does. It honestly does. Right? It's hard for us to say that, especially as people who don't give up. But when someone says, this seems impossible, and you say, no, it's not. <laughs> You're wrong. Uh, it does feel that way. And it's, I think people, you'll lose somebody. You're not going to connect with them if, if they're, um, if they feel that way, because we need to acknowledge that it does feel overwhelmingly impossible, but that's the problem is if we don't feel that we're not going to work as hard as we need to, to gather enough people to really make change. So once we recognize that it sucks and that it's, that we have a lot of work to do to, to fix it, uh, we can start to mobilize and, our website is one of one of the best things I think we've done as part of this project is to give people tons of information, really more than you need, but it's got resources for teachers. It's got tons of information that is all factually backed up with links to documents. And, and then it has um, links to other organizations that you can help with. And right now, one of the best ways is to share the documentary, um, not because we want to see ourselves on film, although Chase has a nice smile. Uh, the more people see the story, the more people are going to connect to those tortoises because people already love them, but they don't know what's going on. Um, so once people know, they're going to be pissed off. And once they realize how terrible it truly is, they're going to want to be a, a part of something. Um, so uh, Chase, as I wrap this up, can you, if you have it, can you throw in the link? Um, Chase is going to throw the petition link in. So, oh, are you, oh, Linda, you were talking about our website. Okay, so there's the website, goforgamesfilm.com. Um, so we found that after talking to a lot of people who work in conservation organizations that have successfully passed legislation and gotten stuff done in um, Tallahassee, their best recommendation was to find a way to create pressure in the legislature and then get somebody to work with you to try to pass a bill. Even if it fails, you gotta start somewhere. So we've released a petition that is calling for FWC reform. I'm not gonna read it to you because it gets a little bit into the weeds, but I will post uh, a link. Um, I'm gonna read just the bullet points of it real quick. So let's see. We want, uh, we want to implement clear and transparent qualification requirements for people that are gonna be appointed to the FWC. Uh, we want to institute measures to identify and prevent conflicts of interest. We want to ensure that the appointment process is transparent, inclusive, and accountable to citizens of Florida, not just the governor. And we're hoping that those three main tenants will make a big difference in who ends up on uh, on the commission. Uh, we don't want them to have any connections to, to either a politician. You can't have made any donations. And you can't have any ties to development. Um, 
I personally am helping write the bill right now. We're actually, I want to expand it from seven people to nine. I don't think seven is enough to cover an entire state, which is in cra crazy populous. Um, but I also, like, I want to have a bunch of different people uh, from a bunch of different areas, agriculture people, hunters, fishers. Um, I think we could have a developer on there, but only one, right? We, people have conservation, people who are scientists, people who do water quality, agriculture. Like if we can get nine plus people on there that have tons of experience and are professionals in their field, if we don't get what we want, then maybe it's not meant to be. But if we can make it a commission that cares, that is full of people who are qualified to make the best decision for our state, then we will start to have good decisions that have science uh, that are science backed and they're actually going to make a difference uh, for, for conservation. So um, that is going to be tough, but the petition is where we want to start. So that petition, copy paste, boom, right there. You can send that petition to anybody. You can email me if you want to, and I'll give you a graphic for it. It's on our social media if you want to share it there. Do whatever you can to get this documentary out there. And when people ask you how to help, send them the petition. Because once they see that there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who are watching and paying attention and asking for change, then when that bill hits the Florida legislature in January, it will have support already for people who know that if they don't vote for it, their constituents are watching. Just like we have problems with developers in the on the commission of the FWC, we've got people whose pockets are padded in Tallahassee. And so if they don't have pressure from their constituents, they're just going to take the money and run with it. So I know I'm preaching to the, to the choir. You guys all know that. But um, that's what I've got at the moment. I'm sure there's lots of other ways, small ways to help. Start a neighborhood watch. Call the FWC if you see problems. Um, whatever you can on your own to try to save individual tortoises is immensely important. Um, but as you guys all know, we have to make greater change. Um, so we join together and talk about it and join organizations like the Sierra Club. And then we sign petitions and then we protest. If anybody wants to help organize a protest, I would love that. We have not done that because it takes too much effort. We all have jobs that we need to do. <laughs> But if, if anybody's already got the, um, the the knowledge of how to organize one of those, I would love that. Uh, yeah, I see um, Gail. You're muted, Gail. Okay. Uh, yes, I just want to thank you um, for letting us know about the Florida Wildlife Commission because it sounds like it's a wonderful uh, group of people. Um, so I think just being knowledgeable of that and uh, signing the petitions and... Um, so we'll we'll try to do all we can. Absolutely. Go yeah. for are awesome. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make the documentary is uh, I asked tons of people ab about, you know, this problem and nobody knew. Nobody knew except for Chase. Chase knew. Um, and when I did my water, my water documentary, too, I, I asked people, like, where's the highest concentration of freshwater springs in the world? And no local Floridians had any idea that it was here. And, and so if people don't know that there's a problem, they're not going to know that there's a solution. And, it, and it's easy for us to be like, the government's got this. They're donating millions to conservation. They don't. They don't. Um, what role do Sheila, any reporters she... use play? Go ahead. Oh. Hi. Oh. Uh, Grant, is there any way that you can uh, at least send to Linda the uh, uh, a petition copy and maybe she can spread it around to us and try to get signatures on it? Yeah, Linda said she was going to send it in the follow-up email. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank um, you. I'm going to do that, but I was going to ask Brent for the graphic as well, because we can post oh, it yeah. on our Facebook page, put it on our website, put it in the next newsletter, well, maybe not the next newsletter, the next one, because the deadline's already here for this, this month's newsletter. Um, and... Let's see. Mary did ask. I didn't mean to. I think I interrupted Mary's text with Sheila's question. What role do any of the Florida zoos play, if any? Um, man, that's a question that you might want to email Chase because he could talk about it at length. But very simply put, there's politics involved in zoos, too. Uh, so some of them do conservation work. I actually work, uh, I got into education, conservation education when I worked at SeaWorld and they have 
um, their veterinarians actually take in um, gopher tortoises that were injured and they rehabilitate them and send them back out. Um, but there are politics involved <clears throat> for these zoos as well. And I know that because we've asked some of them to share the documentary and so far none of them have been willing. Um, not that they don't care. Um, it's that they're, they just don't want any sort of public blowback and um, some of the zoos are, you know, struggling as it is. So it's tough for them. I understand it. We didn't, we never pushed anybody to share it that wasn't comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, I, I'd email Chase if you really want to know some stories. Um, but I wish zoos could do more, but to be honest, they don't have a lot of funding either. So, and they're not, they're not large enough to take in a bunch of tortoises. The real answer here is to have land that's conserved in mass and to put protections, you know, a, alongside that. And um, zoos don't have a lot that they could do, to be honest, other than rehab and release. Well, that's a good lead into Lisa's comment that we're lucky in Palm Beach County that um, we have protected hundreds of acres for gopher tortoise in the habitat and natural areas. I oh. think I've heard numbers like Palm Beach County has over 30% of their land of our land kind of locked up for habitat. A lot of that is the Loxachee Refuge. That's a huge chunk, but there's also the Corbett area, um, all kinds of nature areas, our, our own um, galaxy pine wood scrub area in Boynton Beach has, I don't know, Lisa, how many gopher tortoise do you think are on that 12 acres? Um, well, we've identified a minimum of five active burrows, but gopher tortoises will have more than one burrow. Um, so the kind of an average that I've been told is one gopher tortoise for every two and a half burrows. We've seen one really big and perhaps two. And we don't know if they're male or female. It's um, And it's only really what they have left is, is only 10 acres. So um, in the 80s, I believe when that area was originally uh, rehabilitated, they relocated about 30 gopher tortoises to 15 acres, which is just not enough space for that many so we're down to possibly two but the other natural areas that the yamato scrub the huge juno dunes jupiter dunes um those places are i think they have healthy populations Great. And Laura, Laura's added some more for Sea Branch State Preserve in Martin County. Um, but she thinks it might have might might be at capacity. Um, oh, and Chase jumped in. He said zoos play a big role. They have a lot of great initiatives, but have the capability to do amazing things, especially with our endemic species. Uh, that's fair. I didn't give them enough credit, Chase. Um, I know that a lot, I was thinking about more like rescue and rehab. Not a lot of zoos uh, do that in large numbers, but they, education is huge. And that is why I was disappointed that they were, more weren't willing to share this. But but what they do is amazing to, to, to let people know that it is really important to protect these animals. Um, and they do have a lot of initiatives where they, uh, they will organize volunteer groups, which I think is vastly underappreciated especially by me about five minutes ago when i didn't mention it um and i used to go out on those and do turtle watch stuff uh sea world actually organized some of those um, our education department did and yeah a lot of people don't know what zoos do outside of their own grounds for conservation work so um but I, and i don't i don't mean to get on any as we're talking about like moving tortoises around i don't want to chastise anybody because it's important that we talk about it but that's not the solution we need to stop moving them. <laughs> That's what we need to do. We need to save the land and we need to stop focusing how long we can keep them um, quarantined or how far we can move them. We need to find places where we're like, nope, no developers here in perpetuity. This land doesn't move. Um, 
And when we have giant developers come in, uh, someone mentioned it earlier. Yeah, let's work with these giant developers to say, hey, we're going to sell you this land, but 10% of it right in the middle has to be con conservation. It's got to be upland habitat with no water for the tortoises. Um, so it can be done. We just got to stop asking the questions that we've already been intentionally misled to think about and focus on the why do we not have habitat protection along with gopher tortoise protection? I think that's the biggest one. Well, thank you, Brent. I think this has been a very informative um, exchange of ideas and questions. Um, I know people have said it's kind of depressing, but we have to do what we can. Oh, Sheila, you're applauding. So everybody give Brent a big, a big Zoom round of applause. <laughs> and um, we're going to wrap up because it's getting to be that time. Linda? Brent, would you... Yes, Richard. Is that um, chat or is that going to be copy and pasted so we can look at it later? I'm going to include the links that are in the chat um, in the follow up email. If there's something in the chat that I guess I have to make a kind of editorial comment, Here's the you know, that I think would be okay. Yeah. Um, something that is pertinent, I'll try to include it in the email follow up. If anyone has any specific questions, I'll be holding on to the chat for a while and I can share with it individually. But you Thank know, you. some of some of the chat is, you know, applause right now. <laughs> so Thank you, Linda. Okay. Brent, are you ready for the mystery question? And everyone can put their answer into the chat. So get your fingers out and get them situated. Brent, would you like me to ask the mystery question? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to. Yes, go ahead and I'll, I'll give the answer. Okay. The, um, the question is, about how long can a tortoise survive underground after being entombed? Put it in the chat. Okay, Brent, I'm going to ask you to pick the winner. All right, I got three answers in so far. Four. So far, we got two different options. <laughs> I'm going to call out Chase for a second here while people are putting their answers in. Chase said, thank you, folks, for hosting Brent. He did an amazing job with the film. He went above and beyond. Chase deserves just as much credit. My name is at the front of the documentary, and I'm the one answering a lot of questions because I have a solid internet connection. He doesn't. But Chase is the one that finally like was like, you got to do this, do this story. And I did. And he was right. It needed to be done. But I would not have been able to do it without him and our, our other producer. Hey, Pup, this is Bentley, by the way. He's a good boy. <laughs> uh, so, yes. No, Chase. Uh, thank you, Chase. I appreciate that. But, um, yeah, without Chase, I guess without me and Chase, it wouldn't have happened. He deserves a lot of credit. Stuck in 1997 out there. On, in Archer on, the, on his preserve, uh, <laughs> Chase's internet is spotty at best. Okay, I think everybody got their answer in, yes? All right. Um, let's see. Should, I'm gonna, I'll tell you the answer and then I'll pick a winner. Um, it is up to a year. And that is scientific-ish. It has been observed. It has not been documented in an official scientific paper because it's illegal to entomb tortoises. Um, side note, there was... A group of people who filmed who actually a scientist who actually watched gopher tortoise being entombed and then went back later and dug them up and recorded how they were doing um that was the bet that's the closest we've come to any actual scientific document but i have multiple people who are professionals who have told me in person that they have excavated gopher tortoise holes almost a year later and found living gopher tortoises who were borderline alive, but they were alive and they were able to come back to, to perfect health. Um, so if you said a year, uh, up to 12 months uh, or, or a year, you are accurate. Um, and I believe, um, where to go? Sheila. Sheila is the winner. 
And what what is what does Sheila win? She wins a Sierra Club hat. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> I should have made that a harder question because like half of you got it right. <laughs> you just picked a random name. Um, it is crazy though, isn't it? They're reptiles, and we don't think about that, but their their body can just slowly shut down. I'm I'm sorry, I'm giving you too much information, but they're uh they're like they're cold-blooded essentially right so they they can slow down their system um their metabolism just grinds to a halt that's why you can find alligators frozen in a lake with their nose just above the surface as long as they can breathe they can slow down their metabolism and and essentially have like one heartbeat per minute or so something wild and they can live like that you know not indefinitely but up to a year as we've seen with gopher tortoises they're not good and that's a terrible way to die uh, but they don't run out of food. They don't run out of, of water or air. They just slowly waste away to nothing. Um, so it is truly horrible that we allowed that to happen and truly horrible that we still do in some ways. Um, senescence. Yes, the senescence is a term for dying, right? For death, Mary. The act of um, an animal dying. Anyway, theoretically, a lot of reptiles don't have senescence and they could live forever if they had everything they needed to survive but when they're in a situation where the only thing that they do is can't leave and find food then they will live for a very long time so sorry that got super sad <laughs> we no longer allow that theoretically and now we're just trying to stop tortoises being moved thank you guys for staying late enough to uh to talk about it and to do the secret question thank you brent you did an amazing job one more round of Zoom applause. I'm going to stop the recording now. And if anyone